My area is uh, quantum information and the bearing of quantum information and quantum foundations. And uh, we can talk about reconstructions, axiomatic reconstructions, more modern topics like causal orders, like contextuality, various non-classical resources and their bearing on quantum foundations. All of that cannot be really seriously done in 20 minutes. So I've chosen instead to do a very, very small 20 minute talk telling you about the new version of John Wheeler's 20 questions game and then trying to draw some lessons on that. So if, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the game, the game uh, suggested by Wheeler in the 80s is a variation on an old American TV game and Wheeler's variation goes like this. Um, there are players in the room who do not agree to choose any word in advance because in the original game, uh, they agreed to choose a word when one player was out of the room. Now, there are players in the room, they don't choose any word, then the main guy comes in, or girl, and starts asking binary questions. Uh, is it, uh, does it have legs? Uh, somebody says yes or no. Can it fly? Somebody else says yes or no, and so on and so forth. People take more and more time to answer the question, and uh, at the end, after 18 or 19 questions, the main player says, well, it should be a cloud. And everybody starts congratulating everybody because, John Willis said, they had not chosen a concept before, so every player had to come up with a word compatible with all previous answers and give their own answer. And that's how it happens in quantum mechanics, says John Wheeler. There are, the system doesn't pre-exist out there. Uh, it comes as a sequence uh, of yes, no questions. And uh, here's, I think, a new point. What if that sequence doesn't converge? Can we say that these questions are about something? What if, in the end, there's no winning moment? There's no moment when the main player says it's a cloud. Can we say that there is still some information that comes out of these inputs and outputs? And I think that yes. I think that what is happening in quantum information in the last 25 years is that we're learning that this information is not about that unknown term, cloud. Uh, it doesn't have a semantic. And that's uh, one of the main lessons in several publications, including this chapter here in this volume. I've been trying to argue about that. So um, the most... Uh, you know, simple and really paradigmatic example are Popescu Rolex boxes. So let me remind you that Popescu Rolex boxes are non signaling boxes introduced in 1993, 1994 by Sandro Popescu and Daniel Rolex. Um, are non signaling boxes introduced with the question of seeing uh, whether non signaling led us directly to the Tsirilson bound? And uh, the surprising answer was that it did not. So if we only focus on inputs and outputs in the box and on the, pro on the joint probability distribution of the outputs given the inputs, then uh, we can actually imagine a model that uh, gives us correlations that are stronger than quantum correlations. And uh, as most of you, I guess, know, uh, these bounds the classical bound and the maximal non-local bound are polytopes. And the quantum bound here is not a polytope. It's actually not a computable bound. Uh, so that model, uh, which is now 30 years old, has given rise to a whole, whole tradition of various box models. And I'm not going to talk about others. Um, it's a part also, as I see it at least, of what can be called device-independent approaches. Device-independent approaches meaning that we don't know or we don't trust for some reason uh, that inside the box uh, there are, let's say, photons or such and such systems. Uh, but we still want to do physics without presuming any knowledge uh, of what exactly lives inside that box, what is doing the physical job. So we can still do it as we can do it with PR boxes without knowing what's in the box. We can talk about computing CHSH. We can talk about doing communication with these models. We can talk about properties of these maximally non-local worlds. And of course, we can, of co we can talk about 
the Tsirolsen bound seen from the point of view of this, of this new paradigm of quantum theory where the Tsirolsen bound is just one strange number somewhere in the middle between two and four. And the question becomes why is it the Tsirolsen bound and not something else? Before uh, addressing that history of reconstructions, which I will do in a second, um, I was trying five years ago and also in this chapter to sort of really catch out on the philosophical lessons rather than mathematical lessons of what is going on. And I think it is a new and quite a radical shift in the philosophy of quantum mechanics as to speak about these physical processes that are of unspecified character or of unknown nature. We don't know what's in there, uh, but we can still do physics. So of course, when I say it's quite radical and quite new, probably most of you in this room think, oh, no, 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 no. And of course there are historical parallels. And I'm gonna give you some, indeed. Uh, but I do think that one of the crucial lessons uh, of the tw last 25 years in quantum foundations and this comes from research in things like indefinite causal orders, almost quantum correlations, uh, and many other topics, uh, quantum contextuality, uh, generalized contextuality, and so forth, that one of those main lessons is that um, assuming that you have a cloud or a system in your box, that you have it somewhere, is not a given. So in John Wheeler's game, if the answers diverge, it doesn't mean that the game has been lost. It means maybe that the initial presupposition that people have chosen one word was the wrong one. Maybe something else was going on and we just didn't get it con cor correctly. Maybe they had chosen two words, maybe they had chosen n words, we don't know. But so the idea that there is a system to start with should be put into question. Now, of course, this is kind of similar to Einstein being unhappy with uh, uh, principle theories and claiming that there should be constructive theories. So you remember this from, uh, from the 1919 Times uh, article by Einstein. He, he wanted to replace principle theories with constructive theories, except that that never came about. Uh, you know, we're more than 100 years later. Now we believe that principle theories are as good physical theories as constructive theories. Uh, so what if knowledge or specification of the system never came? I think what we're learning from things like indefinite causal orders and quantum information is that those theories can very well be good physical theories. We don't have to say that there should, be, there should be systems. Now, very quickly, maybe two uh, flashbacks into history to support this argument. So now I've given you the, the gist of the main argument uh, I've been trying to defend in various uh, papers. Now, this comes first from the long tradition of uh, reconstructions of quantum theory, axiomatic reconstructions, as you know, started with von Neumann and Birchhoff in 1935. Um, in the last 30 or so years, information theoretic reconstructions have taken that place. And in, th in the business of information theoretic re reconstructions, we've learned that there are two key postulates that make things quantum. One is the amount of correlations, the ones I just mentioned. Why the Tsirolsen bound? Why not slightly more? Why not all the way to four, to maximal CHSH? Uh, why not slightly less? Like, wh what, is it, what principle drives us exactly into two square root of two and not something else? And there have been, of course, the best known example is information causality from Marcin Pavlovsky and company uh, in 2009. There are several other examples. We still don't have a very good understanding of this, but we have now a theorem that says that whatever bipartite principle you have, so whatever principle you may want to have about Alice and Bob, it's not enough. Any kind of bipartite principle will not give you quantum theory fully. It will give you 15 sixteenths of quantum theory. We can even quantify how much, but not, so we, we know that there's something in quantum theory, 
in quantum correlations that escapes from this bipartite view. Another element that needs to be brought into your system of axioms in order to get quantum mechanics is continuity. One is the amount of correlations and the other one is continuity. Actually, if you have a probabilistic model with these two axioms, you will have quantum theory. Continuity can be uh, formulated precisely in different ways. You can talk about continuous transformations between pure states on the sphere. You can talk about, as Nicolas Gisan, for example, does in his recent work about the necessity for complex numbers and not some other number field. So you can have various faces and various versions of continuity axiom. In the end, this will be something about continuity. If you have a discrete field or if you have a non-number field, let's say a polynomial field, uh, behind your Hilbert space, on which you build your Hilbert space, you will not have quantum theory. So uh, these two axioms make things quantum. And I think we've learned it in the last 25 years. We've learned it thanks to all these information theoretic approaches. And now we're trying to play with these axioms. Of course, we're trying to say, well, okay, what happens if we don't have one or another, if we replace it? Um, so there is a lot of uh, game going on. There are a lot, of, a lot of different versions and models going on. And one of those, just quickly, the one I've been also interested in for the last uh, 10, even more than 10 years now, uh, indefinite causal orders. Now, um, very quickly, if you haven't heard about indefinite causal orders, the idea is to put the Alice's lab and Bob's lab not in a defined temporal order. One is before the other but in a superposition, in an order which is like a Schrodinger cat, in a superposition of orders. And uh, this can be done in several mathematical frameworks. One is called uh, the quantum switch, another one is called process matrices, yet another one is called supermaps. Uh, there are other approaches. Now, this has become quite a big uh, science area, you know, discipline within quantum information. What is very interesting in these causal orders are the attempts to make experiments. Of course, scientifically and theoretically, they're also very interesting, but because I have limited time, let me just tell you one thing about these causal orders. When we try to make experiments in which Alice and Bob are not one before the other, but there is a control, a quantum control that puts them in a superposition of orders. People say, no, 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 you have not really done the experiment right. You've simulated an indefinite causal order, but this is not a true indefinite causal order. Why is that? Because quantum control and the target degrees of freedom are actually degrees of freedom of the same system because we don't know how to separate them. But the lesson from this is that all these strange situations allowed by the Hilbert space are very difficult, of course, to uh, realize empirically, to build experimentally. Not so much because the mathematics is, different, is difficult or whatever, the mathematics is not very difficult. But because when we're building things, we of course come with this idea that there's a source and there is a detector. Uh, whereas uh, quantum information uh, in these abstract Hilbert spaces shows us that there are resources that are non-classical, that are quantum resources, like the indefinite causal order, that cannot be easily uh, fleshed out in terms of a system coming out of a source and going into a detector. Um, that's just not the appropriate language for working with these resources. So we have today situations like also generalized contextuality situations, something called the Lugano process, so I'm not defining these things. There are plenty of things on the market which are not easy to define in the language of quantum systems coming out of sources and going into the detectors. So we start to learn that maybe that assumption also needs to be shifted to or go or shift it to the second or level. So to conclude, um, we have this, and uh, Tom Reichman will speak right after me, we have the discussion with Tom whether Einstein always put quotation marks around real or not. And there is a letter found by uh, Don Howard, I think, uh, a letter to Schrodinger in 1935 where Einstein clearly says, 
I want Psi to be about the real state of the real system. Although later, and Tom will show you, I guess, this, uh, Tom, uh, later he always put real in quotation marks. So when he was really careful. And this is the EPR argument. But this is an old mode of thinking about systems. For, for me, what is really interesting here is this. The word real, of course, is subject to the debate about entity realism, property realism, all those kinds of realism. But the very word system maybe has to go. So look at this. This is from Bob Kuke from also some time ago. Uh, so here you will see that uh, systems are a kind of derivative notion. Uh, we have these symbolic diagrams that describe information flow or uh, we can talk about ZX diagrams, we can talk about circuits, uh, we can talk about all sorts of diagrammatic languages and systems are really those stuff that lives on the wires. But we don't have to start with that. So this does introduce, I think, a paradigm shift that is quite interesting and radical and comes from all this research on causal orders uh, almost quantum correlations and so on and so forth. So to end with Wheeler again, I started with the game of 20 questions and in your reading let me end with Wheeler and I really admire Wheeler who was a fantastic visionary. Um, when Wheeler said this in the early 70s, I don't think many people understood very well what he was talking about. I think today we are in a much better position to understand this. The propositions, meaning these binary propositions, are not propositions about anything. So when people say, oh, you talk about quantum information, what is information about? No, 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 it's not about anything. That's a meaningless question. Um, they are the abstract building blocks. Well, Wheeler said in his time, pre-geometry, out of which reality, quote, unquote, you see the Einsteinian quotation marks, is, is conceived. So um, this aboutness or semantics of information, I think, needs to go. And with that, the very notion of system that is somehow predefined, presupposed, needs to go. And that's what, well, this is for me one of the interesting lessons of the last 25 years of quantum information. Thank you.